Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today we'll be talking about Lythronax, our guesties, as well as a bunch of dinosaur news. And next week we'll be reviewing The Good Dinosaur, so you can look forward to that and then Maybe you don't want to listen to the next episode until you see the movie. And just another thank you to our supporters on Patreon. If you'd like to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash I know dino and Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And one of our tiers is pretty cool. It's a surprise goodie of some sort, such as a piece of artwork. And we have at least one paleo artist who has already offered to create something really awesome and special for us to give away. So if you are interested, then please check out our Patreon page. Right now, that perk is at the $50 tier. But we might be lowering it in the future so that we'll give it out to more people. First in the news is a article out of the journal Cretaceous Research a new ornithomimid dinosaur from the Upper Cretaceous Packard Shale Formation in the Cabuyana group of Sonara, Mexico. It was written by Claudia Inez Serrano Granas and some others. So when I think of Mexico and dinosaurs, I'm usually thinking about the Chicxulub, which is that impact site that corresponds to the KT extinction. But there have been quite a few dinosaurs discovered there, and now there's one more. So the new genus and species of ornithomimosaur is named Tototlemimus pacardensis. Being a dinosaur fan, you might know that ornithomimid means bird mimic in Greek, and the word totatl, and I might be pronouncing that wrong, is nahuatl, which is the language that the Aztecs spoke for bird, making totatlemimus another way of saying bird mimic. So the species name refers to the formation where the dinosaur was found, the Packard Shale in Mexico's state Sonora, which is just south of Arizona and New Mexico in the U.S. And the authors say that Totalmimus packardensis is the first definitive ornithomimid described from Mexico, although another potential ornithomimid called Saltiomimus rapidus was found southeast of this find in 2010, but its validity has been questioned a little bit. Either way, this specimen is one of the southernmost ornithomimids in the western interior basin of North America, so it's pretty significant. They only found partial hands and feet, but they believe that it is enough to classify it as its own genus and species, but because there weren't any leg bones discovered, it's hard to estimate its size. National Geographic points out that this find is another recent example of the large diversification that dinosaurs went through between 70 and 80 million years ago, even within Laramidia, which is that area from western Mexico up through eastern Alaska, it was all one landmass, so it's kind of surprising that there was so much diversification going on in that period versus other periods. Next to the news is an article out of PLOS One titled Hadrosaurid Dinosaurs from the Late Cretaceous of the Sultanate of Oman, and it was written by Eric Bouftoot and others. Specifically, it was a team of French, Omani, and Dutch researchers, and they found femora, which is the plural of femur, tibia, and vertebrae of a hadrosaurid. So they found these fossils in the foothills of the Omani Mountains, which is in northern Oman, and if you're not familiar with your Arabian Peninsula geography, Oman is the farthest towards the end of the peninsula, past Saudi Arabia, and then kind of that northeast corner of the peninsula. And these mountains that it was found in are near the United Arab Emirates, where Dubai is and all that. This is not the first evidence of dinosaurs from Arabia, but it is the first hadrosaurid dinosaur discovered there. Quote, Hadrosaurs, according to our traditional understanding, were mainly limited to the northern continents, North America, Europe, Asia. Eric, the lead author of the study, said, and their presence much farther south in this part of the world was previously unknown, end quote. Hadrosaurids are thought to have originated in Laurasia and migrated to other northern continents later where they diversified. In the late Cretaceous, which is when these fossils appear to be from, Europe as well as Oman were basically a series of islands, which makes their occurrence in Oman even more surprising. Specifically, the Afro-Arabian continent was separated from Europe 
by the wide Tethys Ocean. Axel Franz Hartmann said, quote, How these dinosaurs managed to cross the barrier is the interesting question this discovery provides us with. We took a closer look at the string of islands some geologists have reconstructed in this now disappeared Tethys Ocean. These islands may have provided the necessary stepping stones for hadrosaurs to make their way from Eurasia to Oman, end quote. And co-author of the study, Anne Schulp, also said, quote, The rocks in which these bones are fossilized were deposited by a fast-flowing river. This means we hardly find complete bones, let alone complete skeletons. We have to piece back together the puzzle of Omani dinosaurs from the tiniest and often frustratingly damaged and beaten up bone fragments, end quote. So this might be because Oman was a delta back in the Cretaceous period, which is where the river flows into the ocean and Obviously, a lot of things collect there now as well as back then. So it is really interesting to think of a hadrosaur trying to swim across an ocean to get to Oman, which was an island back then, as we said. And it would be interesting to see if they find other dinosaurs that may have had to swim in order to get there and what kind of unique ecosystem they probably had. There's one last dinosaur discovery that I want to talk about. This one isn't a peer-reviewed article or anything like that, but on October 29th, there was a big storm surge from Hurricane Patricia that brought a storm surge into the Bay of Fundy. And our Canadian listeners are probably very familiar with the bay, but for those who aren't, the bay is located between New Brunswick and Nova Scotia in Canada, and the bay's geology causes huge tides. Its tides are often considered the largest in the world, and the tide brings in and out 160 billion metric tons of water, varying the height of the water by almost 15 meters or 50 feet on a daily basis. So when the storm surge brought in extra water, the tide went even higher. And just as an aside, when Sabrina and I were living in New Jersey, we saw some of the tourism that they do in the Bay of Fundy. You can get on a raft and kind of like ride a little bit of it in, in various areas where the inlet's narrow and stuff. But it's not quite as dramatic as those catastrophic movies show, you know, quote-unquote tidal waves. It's really more just like a slow rise of water, like you get at the tide at any ocean. Yeah, it sounds like a really great place to see, and we didn't get a chance to go over there when we lived on the East Coast of New Jersey. But we're hoping in a year or two to go on an epic road trip across Montana, North Dakota, all the states up into Canada that have that are known for their dinosaur fossils and see all that we can and then make our way to the Bay of Fundy. Yeah, before we were just thinking about going through Montana and the Dakotas and some of the places where a lot of the American dinosaurs are, and then up to Alberta where Phil Curry's awesome museum is. But now that we know about this thing at the Bay of Fundy, we might have to extend our road trip another 3,700 miles, or at least that's, a, that's how far the drive is from our house now, which is a pretty long way to go. So back to the discovery, the waves at Lawson Bluff, which is where the dinosaur research site is located, experienced this extra erosion, and a private mineral collector contacted Tim Fedak, director of the Fundy Geological Museum, to examine the cliff. Tim took photos to be used to create 3D scans of the bones in the cliff face. He then carved a channel around the bones because it was supposed to rain and he didn't want the fossils to be eroded any further now that they were exposed. And then once the rain stopped, he expanded the channel and took the block out of the cliff that had the little bones in it. It's not a, a whole lot of bones. It's The block that he took out is probably the size of like a football, basically. It's now at the Fundy Geological Museum, in Parsboro, Nova Scotia, which is about 8 kilometers or 5 miles west of where they were discovered. And obviously that geological museum is there because of the dinosaur discoveries that were made in the area previously. From the Herald News, there was a pretty nice quote describing what the dinosaur may have been like. Quote, And almost certainly the bones belong to a prosauropod dinosaur, a plant, fern, and conifer-munching beast, that roamed the earth about 200 million years ago. This particular dinosaur would be about 3 to 4 meters long, weigh less than a ton, and would be about a meter and a half off the ground at the hip. It would probably reach the size of an extra long and heavy cow with a long neck and long tail. This is the first time I'd heard a dinosaur equated to a cow, but I think it's probably pretty fitting given the area where it's discovered. 
So like Sabrina and I said, we want to make it to that Fundy Geological Museum in Parsboro, Nova Scotia. We just have to find time to drive 3,700 miles. No big deal. Another potential museum this time that's in the news. The news site KSL.com is reporting that there is a preliminary proposal to make a, quote, Dinosaurs of Utah Museum near Tokyo in Japan. So this is according to James Cross, who says, quote, we have proposed that with our contacts in Japan, and it has been very well received, end quote. So Cross's team designed and built a wooden skid that helped the Utah Geological Survey recover a nine-ton sandstone block that was perched on a steep slope north of Moab. This is the slab we talked about with Utah State Paleontologist Jim Kirkland in episode 34 that is supposed to have quite a few Utah raptors in it. And apparently after helping with excavating these dinosaurs as well as a few other, Cross kind of got this bug of dinosaurs and now he's trying to expand his dinosaur work. So officials of Thanksgiving Point in Utah are reportedly also exploring the idea of a traveling exhibit that may go to Japan, which Governor Gary Herbert from Utah recently endorsed in a letter to a lawmaker in Japan. Cross's proposal is to instead install a permanent $50 million museum in Japan to highlight Utah's dinosaurs, and he points out, quote, there are more dinosaurs, more species found in Utah than almost anywhere in the world. Jim Kirkland also supports this idea, saying, quote, we have the most complete record of the history of dinosaurs anywhere on planet Earth. We really do. So it's very deserving of something on that scale, end quote. He also hopes that opening a museum or a traveling exhibit may help generate funding for excavating the slab of Utah raptors, and we definitely hope so too. When we spoke to him, he talked a lot about that and how much he wanted to excavate that block and all the information that's probably tied up in it. We mentioned in an earlier episode that Crytek, that's the producer of many really awesome-looking video games. Their first big one was Far Cry, and it had all this awesome water stuff. It's very exciting. Uh, <laughs> they made a virtual reality demonstration environment titled Back to Dinosaur Island, where a T-Rex basically runs up and roars at you, Jurassic Park style, and it must be a really intense VR experience. So I didn't notice this when we talked about it the first time, but apparently the perspective of the VR is supposed to be a baby dinosaur. And I guess that kind of makes sense. It looks a little bit intimidating, but, you know, T-Rex has that going for it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's a bit of an understatement. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why T-Rex is roaring at its baby, but anyway. Maybe it's nudging it. Go out. Could be. Come hunt. Yeah, maybe it does kind of scamper off in the end. So, unfortunately, in order to watch the video, you have to have a VR headset, and obviously not very many people have those, and not just any VR headset. The simple cardboard app that the New York Times has been supplying for cell phones isn't good enough. You need to have a purpose-built VR gaming quality plug into an expensive computer type headset, and in this case, the only one that's out right now that'll work is the Oculus Rift Development Kit 2 which has the name implies isn't meant for consumers and costs about $350. Although I couldn't find it for sale anywhere online, but if you have one, you can download the Dinosaur Island demo for free via Steam and pretend to be a baby dinosaur. So this kind of sent me down a rabbit hole a little bit because I was thinking I really want to do this and see this VR stuff and there's a lot of other cool VR going on. This happens probably at least once a week. Garrett goes down a rabbit hole. Something <laughs> cool about dinosaurs. <laughs> yeah, or other technology. So Oculus was originally launched on Kickstarter as this VR environment. It was really successful at the time. And they finally announced their consumer edition of the headset, which is supposed to come out within the next few months. But they haven't set a price yet. Probably somewhere between $350 and $500. So I do really want to get one of these. Sabrina, just saying. Oh, I know. <laughs> and <laughs> apparently the headset works with lots of games in the Steam library that have VR enabled, including Ark Survival Evolved, which is the game we talked about where you're on an island with other people and dinosaurs, and you can ride them and train them. And so we might have to actually get two so that Sabrina can play two. 
<laughs> and then if our friends come over, we might as well get four, <laughs> just in case. <laughs> That's just ridiculous. The one problem I've seen a few times, though, is that they cause motion sickness in some people, and Sabrina and I get motion sickness a little bit worse than some people, so... Oh, no. Yeah. Maybe we'll just suffer through it for the dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> So there's a game that definitely won't give you motion sickness, and it's been out for a little while. It's called Plants vs. Zombies 2. I hadn't played it before I saw this news story. The original Plants vs. Zombie was plenty of plants and zombies for me, but now they have dinosaurs. So I had to download it and then see what was going on. Specifically, they created a Jurassic Marsh Part 1, they call it. When I downloaded it, I confirmed that it's all added in there. It looks like it was added a few days ago. It's supposed to have three new dinosaurs, and the way they describe it is kind of funny. It has a raptor, a dinosaur which has the ability to kick a zombie forward down the lane, a stegosaurus with the ability to catapult zombies into adjacent lanes. With its tail? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how a stegosaurus catapults things, but... Well, if it's like a monkey tail, I could see that prehensile stegosaurus tail mm -hmm. and then there's also supposed to be a pterodactyl so as a correction they really have two dinosaurs and a pterodactyl so they also added some prehistoric themed plants and zombies and i installed the game and then found that the expansion cost five dollars and apparently most of the plants cost like three to five dollars as well and apparently you can blow through a lot of money on this game. Some people actually spend hundreds of dollars. So if you're one of the types of people that tend to get hooked by these things and spending lots of money, like Sabrina over here. Yeah. Been known to. I hear there's a term for it. They're called whales. Like in Las Vegas. They, gambling. Yeah, they, they have the apps the most money. Yeah. So, so I'm going to be staying away. Yeah, definitely stay away if you have that kind of a problem. I don't think it's anything so exciting that it's worth... I don't even know if it's worth $5, to be honest. I'll probably pay it so that I can say how worth it it is on this. Tell me how the Stegosaurus catapults. I'll let you play it on my phone. <laughs> Since you don't have my password to pay money on it. See how it is? Yep. <laughs> Next in the news, according to the New York Post, the Sinclair Oil Dinosaur will make its first appearance in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade since 1976. But when I saw these pictures of the dinosaur with the strings and all the people practicing with it, I assumed it was a good dinosaur thing because they're both green sauropods, so I made the assumption, especially since good dinosaur is coming out on Thanksgiving. So the New York Post isn't necessarily the most reputable source, which makes me think... It might not really be the Sinclair oil balloon since Sinclair... When we drove across the country, I think we ran into a couple stations in Wyoming. It's from, like, Casper, Wyoming, I think. But anyway, it's kind of weird that they would be making a comeback in the Macy's Day Parade when there happens to be this movie also coming out. So I'm thinking maybe Pixar bought the balloon from Sinclair, or they have some kind of combination situation going on. We'll just have to watch the parade. Could be a chance for Sinclair to come back. Yeah. <laughs> the viral marketing of good dinosaur. So now that we're done with Thanksgiving news, I can go to Christmas news. There's a list of the 10 most dangerous Christmas toys that are put out by toysafety.org. And this year, there's one called Velociraptor Claws. And their summary of it is, Watch out! These oversized claws, based on images and characters from the popular Jurassic World franchise, are sold to enable four-year-olds to, quote, claw like a raptor. No warnings or cautions are provided regarding the potential for eye and facial injuries. So if you look at a picture of these, they basically look like big, stiff, three-fingered gloves. And I think the only thing they would probably be fun for is attacking your siblings or other things around your house. And definitely not something you would want your kids to have. Although as an uncle, I admit that I was briefly tempted to get them and give them to my hell-raising nephews. But, uh... What kind of uncle? <laughs> I, I'm not going to do it. Because they do look pretty dangerous. We'll just get them some little dinosaur Legos or something instead. But not for little ones, because they can choke. They can have dinosaur Duplos. <laughs> and last in the news, this one isn't really news, because it happened in 2013. But 
Taylor McCoy posted a GIF on, or a GIF, depending on what you prefer, on Google Plus of a marching band going into the shape of a T-Rex and then even making it move and roar a little bit, which was super awesome. I was so thrilled by this. Thanks, Taylor, for posting that. It brought me a lot of joy. Yeah, it's really fun to watch. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't resist finding the original source of this, and on YouTube I found a video from 2013, and they went through several different movies in it. They also did Superman flying to correct a falling building, and Harry Potter on a broomstick chasing the golden snitch, and then a pirate ship battle. Since it's from 2013, it's all like Pirates of the Caribbean and Harry Potter and stuff. But anyway, the best was definitely the T-Rex that spanned pretty much the whole field, and it's definitely worth watching at least the GIF, if not going to the YouTube link that we'll post. And that wraps up the news. Now on for the dinosaur of the day, Lythronax, which was requested from Brendan via Facebook. So thanks, Brendan. If my voice sounds funny, it's because I was on a uh, company summit for the past week and got a little bit sick. So I apologize for that. But on the bright side, the summit was great. <laughs> anyway, back to the dinosaur of the day. So Lythronax is a tyrannosaur theropod that lived in what is now modern-day Utah. It lived in the late Cretaceous. The species is Lythronax argestes, which it's known from an adult specimen consisting of a nearly complete skull, pubic bones, tibia, fibula, and metatarsals. The name means gore king, and the name uses king, like in T-Rex, because it's so similar to T-Rex. So T-Rex means tyrant, lizard, or... You know, people think of it as the king. Anyway, Argestes refers to the area in Utah where the fossils were found. The bones were discovered in 2009 in Utah in the Grand Staircase area, which we've mentioned before in previous episodes that's come up in the news. The Waweep Formation, specifically where it was found, is part of the Grand Staircase region, and it had a wet seasonal climate and lakes, floodplains, and rivers. The full name of the Grand Staircase region is Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument, and it's been described as, quote, the last great largely unexplored dinosaur boneyard in the lower 48 states. This is according to Scott Sampson. Lythronax lived in Laramidia, which was a landmass that was separated from North America by a seaway, and it's the earliest tyrannosaurid from Laramidia, so the oldest known. It's also the most complete specimen from southern Laramidia. Laramidia was swampy and coastal to a subtropical island continent. Again, Lythronax was the, is the earliest known tyrannosaur from southern Laramidia, but earlier tyrannosaurs from other areas were much smaller, such as Guanlong. It took a year to excavate Lythronax. The specimen is now housed in the Natural History Museum of Utah in Salt Lake City, and it took 10 months to prepare the bones, which was done mostly by volunteers. It wasn't officially named until November 2013 when the study was published. So Lythronax is a bipedal carnivore. It's 26 feet or 8 meters long and 5,500 pounds or 2.5 tons. This is based on close relatives sizes. And Lythronax had forward-facing eyes, a narrow snout, and a wide back of the skull, which researchers thought didn't appear until 70 million years ago, but Lythronax was 10 million years earlier than that. Its skull is similar to that of a T-Rex with its eyes facing front, so it had depth perception. And its skull is also similar to Tarbosaurus. But T-Rex lived 10 to 12 million years later than Lythronax. So Lythronax probably evolved in isolation on Laramidia. Lythronax probably shows that there are different Tyrannosaur species that lived in North and South Laramidia at the same time. And the seaway grew smaller, but climate variations and different food sources may explain why late Cretaceous dinosaurs in Western North America look different from dinosaurs on other continents at the same time. Because geologically, Lythronax is the oldest known tyrannosaurid from southern Laramidia and is most closely related to T-Rex and Tarbosaurus, which are the geologically youngest tyrannosaurids, the tyrannosaurid group probably diversified earlier than 80 million years ago, so there's probably a lot of other unknown tyrannosaurids to be discovered, so that's pretty exciting. Some tyrannosaurids probably immigrated to Asia around the end of the Cretaceous, or some originated in northern Laramidia or western North America, with many species moving to southern Laramidia. There was a study that analyzed 501 skeletal features in 54 species of carnivorous dinosaurs and found Lythrodax to be most closely related to T. rex and Tarbosaurus. Lythrodax had large teeth that were quote-unquote banana-shaped meat cleavers, though they were actually smaller than bananas, and they were serrated. They probably used their teeth to crush bone and slice flesh, and they could probably swallow their meat whole. 
The teeth are described as banana-like because they're round and curved back. It was probably the largest predator of its time and place. Herbivores in the area included hadrosaurs and chylosaurs and ceratopsians, so may have gone after those for food. And if you want, you could see a skull of Lythronax at the Natural History Museum of Utah. So Lythronax was a tyrannosaurid. Tyrannosauridae means tyrant lizards and they're theropods. There's two subfamilies with up to 11 genera, but the number of genera is controversial. Some people think that there may only be three. They lived in the late Cretaceous in Asia and North America. They're usually the largest predators in their time and place. One of the largest species was T-Rex. Not many complete specimens have been found for known tyrannosaurids, but many genera have complete skulls. Some tyrannosaurids had crests above their eyes. They tended to have small arms but long legs, and juvenile tyrannosaurids had longer legs that were more suited to running fast, but then that changed as they became adults. Scientists used to think tyrannosaurids moved between Asia and North America via the Bering Strait, but now they think all Asian tyrannosaurids may have been part of one evolutionary lineage. Our fun fact of the day comes from another rabbit hole. In the episode about the Omani fossils, I mentioned that they get broken up and kind of damaged. So I was wondering how they put these things back together. And Anthony Maltese on his blog described the process of putting together a Dyspletosaurus bone that started in many pieces. So he said the process is basically, first you glue all the small pieces together, and then you use epoxy clay to fill large holes and cracks. And then you use gypsum cement to fill the really small cracks that you don't fill with the epoxy clay. And then finally, you put one last layer of resin over the whole thing to make it shiny and kind of give it a protective coating and keep the epoxy and gypsum in place when you do the molding and all that good stuff. So it's kind of a long process, and obviously the more damaged a bone is from the fossilization process, the more work it's going to take just to get a nice bone at the end of it, and that comes after finding all the pieces and figuring out where you want the epoxy to fill in gaps and cracks, because obviously you don't fill in everything since there were natural voids. I thought that was pretty interesting. We'll post a link to his blog where you can see pictures of the different steps as well. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. To our U.S. listeners, happy Thanksgiving. Enjoy the holidays. It's one of my favorite holidays. I love eating all the food. <laughs> and if you get a chance, please check out our Patreon page. We really appreciate it. It's patreon.com slash I Know Dino. Thanks again, and until next time. Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.